Thanks for coming out to be with us. We have a lot to get to today, and I know we all want to get out of here by at least 2 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Let me ask you to stand, and let me start us with a prayer, and I'm really glad you're here. There is a card on the seat uh, in front of you. You can fill that out and place it in the collection plate later. If there's something that you want us to pray about, let us know, and we'll pray over it. But let's pray right now. Holy God, thank you for being a burden-lifting God. Thank you for being a God who unbreaks what is broken. Thank you for being a God who is working in our lives even when we don't see, don't suspect, can't see the evidence, but you are there and you are mending, you are healing, you are restoring. Thank you for being that kind of God and help us feel that this morning in our worship as we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's praise the Lord together. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, bruised and broken by the fall. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pardoning love for all. He is able, he is able, he is willing, doubt no more. He is able. Jesus ready stands to save you. 
Thank you. 
Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice, he will not falter or be discouraged, till he establishes justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put their hope. This is what the Lord God says, the creator of the heavens, who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you, and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind and free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Be seated, please. What can take a dying man and raise him up to life again? What can heal a wounded soul? What can make this life slow? What can fill the emptiness? What can mend our brokenness? Brokenness. Mighty, awesome, wonderful is the Holy Cross.
Good morning, church. Good morning to all my balcony people up there. How's everybody doing? They recruit up there. They, no one's safe. Jody and Lincoln will come find you. I'm living proof of that. But don't worry, Jody, there's a lot of talent up there. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be a parent and have kids, there's that phase when they're initially born and you're just exhausted. You don't know what you're doing. And God blesses you because there's this look that the, your children have that makes you think that makes you think at least that they think you're perfect. And there's a period of their youth and adolescence where they probably do think we're perfect. Dad is Superman. He's he's a professional athlete. He he can, you know, fix anything around the house. He's just perfect. And then that dreaded day comes and your kids realize you're not perfect. You all know this. Every one of you. Just ask Grant, he'll tell you. And Avery and Reed, they'll be glad to let you know all my flaws. And it's, you know, it's difficult as parents when the, your children find, realize that we're, that we're flawed and we're not perfect. But it's a good lesson for all of us that, to realize we're flawed. We all sin, we all have issues. And we can work on some things. We can, we can work on you know, some of our flaws. For example, you know, I may not be the most patient person. I'm sure there's an app for that. I just don't have the patience to go find it. But, you know, there are, there are things we can work on. Um, if we're not happy with our appearance, you know, we can diet, we can exercise. If we're, if we're not happy with our job performance, we can, you know, talk to our boss about what we can do better and work harder. But there's one thing that we in our own power and strength and can never fix. There's a flaw that we can't do anything about and that is our sinful nature. And that being apart from God in our, in our flesh and in our sinful nature, the only thing, the only thing that can reconcile us, that can take that flaw away, is Christ and, and, and the sacrifice he made on the cross and what he did for us on Calvary. And Paul in Romans has an in, interesting observation about this. And I wanted to share that with you this morning. And if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read from Romans uh, chapter uh, 7, verse 7. And Paul's talking about the flesh in this, in this section of Romans. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin is. Sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced to me every kind of co covetous desires. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me, and through the commandment put me to death. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good then become death to me? By no means. But in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it produced death in me through what was good, so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. From my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from the body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. We all have this sinful nature that we wage against, but thankfully we have a rescuer, as Paul says. We have someone who can, we can go to and ask for forgiveness to get back and become right with God, our creator. And as we take communion this morning, let us think about that. Let us reflect and meditate on Jesus in his role as rescuer, someone that has bridged that gap, that sinful nature that we have and brought us back into communion with the Father. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we are so thankful that you are our rescuer. We are so thankful that we have a way to wage against the sinful nature through your power and through what you did on, on the cross. Thank you for that ultimate sacrifice. Help us to reflect on that through communion today. Help us to think about your death, your burial, and your resurrection and what it means to us as your children. And it's in your name I pray, amen. So Let's reflect on how we are flawed today. Let's reflect on how Christ's blood 
washes those transgressions away and how he takes brokenness and makes us whole again. And what a wonderful thing that is, that it's not us, but it's him that does that. Pray with me. Lord, we are flawed and broken and we, we try to work on a lot of things, Father, and, and do things on our own. But I'm so grateful and we are so grateful as a people that you are the pathway, that you are the redeemer, that you went to the cross and died for us, Father, so that knowing that we didn't have the power, that we were sinful in our flesh, knowing that we could never do, accomplish what you could, you took that burden on yourself and did that for us. Lord, help us to be thankful for that. Help us to reflect on that as we take the cup and help us to have a grateful heart as we leave here today for your sacrifice and love for us. And it's in your name we pray, amen.
God, we are grateful that you are the answer to every broken dream. We are grateful that you are the healer of every brokenness. And we are honored that you have chosen us to bring out of our broken state. And so we offer our thanks. As we take this offering this morning, may we be mindful not only of what goes into this simple plate, but the offering that we make on your behalf every day of the week, everywhere that we go, because of the healing of our brokenness. And this is our prayer and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And let's take our offering. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. You are the only truth and the way. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than the name of Jesus. No sweeter name than I've ever known. No sweeter name. So we are going to begin a new series this morning uh, from a really old book and an old story in Scripture. Uh, the book of Nehemiah is where we're going to be. The series is titled Restored, Unbreaking What's Broken. And if you want to uh, find the book of Nehemiah, if, you, if you're using the hard copy Bible, just let it open to the middle. It'll land somewhere in the Psalms and then back up a little bit toward the beginning. If you're on your device and you need my help, then I really can't help you, okay? <laughs> so anyway, that's where we'll be. Uh, and I, I think what you're going to find is that this story, even though it's really super old, I mean, this stuff happens like in 447 BC, way back there. I think it's still going to connect with your story in a really powerful way because we, we've been singing about and talking about that this morning already. We've all got some brokenness in our lives. Some, something that's not the way it needs to be, it's not the way it used to be, or maybe it never was. Uh, and that this story is about a place and a people 
that had been broken for a century and a half and how one guy cared and did something about the brokenness. So it'll resonate. Here's the roadmap just for this message this morning. I'm going to read the passage. Uh, We're just going to do Nehemiah chapter 1, the first four verses, so not a long reading. But read the passage, tell you a story, then I'm going to share a principle, and then I'm going to ask you a question, okay? So passage, story, principle, question. There's the roadmap. Here's the passage, Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the the words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah. Boy, I'm glad we don't use those names these days, right? What's your name? Hakaliah. In the, ni- in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Kislev is a, uh, on the Jewish calendar. It's November, December on our calendar. Uh, 20th year of King Artaxerxes. Susa is the capital city of Persia. It's in Iran. Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah, which is where Jerusalem was, with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Nehemiah goes, hey, tell me, how are the people that that didn't get taken into exile or who have gone back, how are they doing? How's, How's my town? How's my city doing? Here's what they said. Those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Key words that I want you to see there in those first four verses are in verse three, trouble, disgrace, broken, and burned. That's, that's what's going on in the world, Nehemiah's world right now. Okay, there's the passage. Here's the story. Once, when I was eight or nine years old, I was exploring in my grandmother's expansive backyard, huge backyard. Of course, as a kid, everything's big. I haven't been back there for decades, but man, back then, it was like huge. And then at at the end of the backyard, woods that went on for days and days. My brother and I rambled through those woods and explored those woods and never found the end of them. I was in the backyard of my grandmother. I was looking for snakes or insects or spiders or evidence of the UFO she said she had seen a few days before. <laughs> Seriously, Mima said that she, one morning she woke up and she came in. She sat down to have her coffee, which she always slurped in an annoyingly loud way. She said, well, I saw a UFO last night. Lights in the, in the shape of a circle landed back there in the woods. Well, that's imagination gold to a couple of boys. So my brother and I were in the backyard. We didn't find any snakes. We didn't find any, uh, we didn't find any insects. We didn't find any spiders. So the UFO angle was looking good because, as you know, uh, an absence of those creatures suggests alien interference with the environment. <laughs> you people at Research Park and the Arsenal already know that, don't you? Right? So anyway, so I was looking, looking for the UFO, and then I, I heard this conspiratorial voice behind me. Psst. Hey, kid, over here, one of the windows in my grandmother's basement was talking to me. I was always terrified of that basement. I mean, it had a dozen windows across the back, right? But it seemed supernaturally dark in there, like it was the portal to a terrestrial black hole that sucked into its Stygian vortex, everything that was good and bright. The dirt floor was simultaneously damp and hard as concrete. How does that even happen? And the air inside there, the basement was permanently chilled and smelled like the most inner chamber of an undiscovered Egyptian pyramid. And now one of those, one of those black eyes, the broken window, was talking to me. And it said, kid, you see that stone at your feet? Pick it up. Well, you don't disobey an evil window, right? So I picked it up, picked up the stone, and the window said, good, now throw it. Throw the stone with all your might through one of the unbroken windows. And I think the window kind of picked up on my hesitation because I knew that throwing a rock through a window 
was not the right thing to do. And so the broken window said, it's okay, kid, really. The old lady won't care. I mean, if she cared, she would have already repaired me. I've been broken for ages. Throw the stone. So I threw the stone, threw a rope right through one of those unbroken windows, went right through the middle, smashed it, shattered it, and if, I got to tell you, it felt good. But the window lied because Meemaw cared. And my dad cared. And they communicated their concern to me in a way that I haven't forgotten in low these 50 years. Okay, there's the story. Here's the principle. Brokenness is contagious. Brokenness is catchy. It's infectious. In the early 1980s, two sociologists named Wilson and Kelling introduced the idea that visible signs of neglect in the community, a single broken window in a vacant building, gang tags on a bridge, an unkept yard, silently send the message that nobody cares. And if nobody does anything about what's broken, the window or the gang tags, the yard, then pretty soon more windows are going to be broken. And there are going to be more gang tags on bridges. And there are going to be more unkept yards. And ultimately, those indicators of community neglect and apathy, Wilson and Kelling said, lead to crime. They wrote, a broken window transmits to criminals the message that a community displays a lack of informal social control and so is unable or unwilling to defend itself. On the other hand, they suggested that if the trash is picked up and if the windows are repaired, if the graffiti is removed, the message the community sends is not only do we care, but we are watching what's going on within our borders. Wilson and Kelling's theory was based on a 1969 experiment performed by a pretty infamous Stanford professor named Philip Zimbardo. He's the one that came up with the Stanford prison experiment. You can look that up later. Not now, because I'm talking. Look it up later. Uh, he, he, he abandoned two cars, one in the Bronx, New York, and one in Palo Alto, California. The Bronx was high crime, low income. Palo Alto was upscale. He took the tags off both cars, raised the hoods, and walked away from them. Within 10 minutes, the car in the Bronx was being stripped for parts, and when all the usable parts were gone, people just vandalized it, and then kids moved in made it a playhouse. In Palo Alto, in the upscale neighborhood, nobody did anything to the car for a week. And then Zimbardo went out with a sledgehammer and broke out one of the windows. Within 30 minutes, the Palo Alto rich folks were stripping the car for parts and vandalizing it just like they'd done in the Bronx. See, we think that the idea that the infectious nature of brokenness applies only to other people, to low-income minority communities. Zimbardo's experiment suggests otherwise. And a few years ago, I actually saw his experiment played out in a real-life situation. Most of us are too young to remember this, but in 1972, in the Olympic Games, a four-foot-11 Russian gymnast named Olga Corbett changed, changed gymnastics forever. Uh, before her performance, women's gymnastics was mostly about art and expression and grace. It was kind of like ballet. After her, it was about athleticism and strength. She won four gold medals. She was the first inductee into the International Gymnastics Hall of Fame. I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think she was the first gymnast to ever get a perfect 10 as a score for her performance. She became instantly an international celebrity. She met Nixon, and Richard Nixon said to her, you have done more to ease relations from the Cold War than all the ambassadors and negotiations and everything else we've tried for, for the last decade. She, after the Olympics, she went back to her home, which was near where Chernobyl nuclear accident happened. And so when that happened, she and her family moved to New Jersey, and then they moved to Atlanta, and then they moved into my neighborhood. I actually lived in the same neighborhood with Olga Corbett. She had this semicircular driveway with the Olympic rings and bricks set in the side. It was very cool. 
And it was very cool to live in the neighborhood with somebody that famous. But celebrities are not immune to struggle. And there were neighborhood rumors that she and her husband had divorced and she had moved to Arizona. And then one day, a half dozen police cars and unmarked black SUVs pulled up into her house on the Olympic ringed driveway. Serious looking men kicked in her door and they arrested her son and another man on counterfeit charges. They found stacks of hundred dollar bills throughout the house. The suspects were handcuffed and hauled off. The house was left open and abandoned. The grass went uncut. The backyard gate hung loosely on its hinges. And for several weeks, our upper middle class golf course community maintained its decorum. But then one warm Saturday afternoon, somebody entered the house and they came out with a souvenir. And then two people went in and then five. And before you knew it, there was a neighborhood feeding frenzy. People running into the house and running out with whatever they could find, treasures of all kinds. Dozens of neighbors rummaging through that house, taking whatever they wanted. This was not a high crime, low income neighborhood. These were nice white folks who drove BMWs and Denali's and played golf at the country club on Sunday afternoon. Brokenness pays no attention to your zip code, your tax bracket, or your skin color. We are all vulnerable, we are all susceptible, and it is contagious. A lot of you heard of Bren Brown or Brene Brown. I'm not exactly sure how she pronounces her first name. She's very popular on TED Talks. She did one on vulnerability in 2013, and, and she said, we are those people. She said, the truth is, we are the others. Most of us are one paycheck, one divorce, one drug-addicted kid, one health diagnosis, one serious illness, one sexual assault, one drinking binge, one night of unprotected sex, one affair away from being those people, the ones that we don't trust, the ones that we pity, the ones that we don't let our children play with, the ones that we, the bad things happen to, the ones that we don't want living next door. We are them. Here's where the, the passage that we read to begin with and the story that I told you about the evil window and the principle, brokenness is contagious. Here's where they all come together. Jerusalem was destroyed in 587 B.C. Nehemiah heard the news about how things were going in Jerusalem in 445 B.C. For nearly a century and a half, the survivors of Jerusalem had been in trouble and disgrace. They had been living in the brokenness. They had been stepping over the rubble. They had adapted to the devastation, and nobody cared anymore. I think there's a spiritual equivalent. Just as people can settle for a sense of physical forsakenness, we can grow accustomed to the debris of spiritual decay. We, we just learn to live with it. We step over the rubble of broken lives. We settle for living in a community that's been shattered by sin. Over time, gradually, it just becomes kind of how things are. Did you ever notice that the things that used to make you blush don't anymore? That the things that used to offend have been normalized? So here's the question. What's your broken window? What's your broken window? What's the area in your life that needs to be repaired, the rubble that you've just been stepping over, the debris that you've just gotten used to, the crack in the sidewalk that you don't even see anymore, what's your broken window? Maybe it's got something to do with the way you treat other people, the way you talk to other people, or the way you talk about other people. Maybe, it, maybe your broken window is the way you spend your resources, your time and your money, and if you're, if you're spending all your time and all your money on you, you've got some work to do. Or maybe it's a more interior kind of neglect. How's your thought life? Is your imagination behaving? Would you be okay for somebody to look at your internet search history? Does your broken window have something to do with your integrity at work, at home? Is there a habit you need to break? Is there one you need to take up? Are you drinking too much? Remember, brokenness is contagious. If one part of your life is not where God wants it to be. If it's broken, then other parts of your life are going to be broken. 
And by the way, that's why what's going on in your life matters to me and what's going on in my life matters to you. See, we're fond of telling people, stay in your lane, mind your own business, get out of my grill, I'm free and autonomous, I make my own decisions, nobody can tell me what to do, my life, what I do in my life is none of your business as long as nobody gets hurt, but that's the point. Everybody is affected by what you and I do. What you do, what I do affects somebody else. The, the decisions we reach, the actions we take, the choices we make ripple out from our lives and touch the lives of others around us. And so my broken window is very much your business and your broken window is very much mine. And when I get to work on my broken windows, it makes the whole street better. When you get to work on yours, everybody around you benefits. So what's your broken window? What's the one area of your life that you need to get busy restoring? When Nehemiah got the news of the devastation the people of Jerusalem were living, he writes, and this is verse 4, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed to the God of heaven. That is a great, perfect first response. It's called repentance. And then he went to Jerusalem We'll, we'll get into the story. He went to Jerusalem and he restored everything that was broken. Brokenness is not the only thing that's catchy, that's contagious, that's infectious. So is the will to renovate, renew, and restore. You would be amazed what might happen if you got busy or I got busy repairing what's broken in my life, watching how that affects other people. Powerful caveat. I had a mechanic in Atlanta that would charge me extra if I brought him something to repair that I had already tried to work on. <laughs> and I love to work on stuff, and so I would often have to take something that I had fouled up, and so he would have to clean up my mess and then fix what was originally wrong with the car. There are some things you can't fix by yourself. Appreciated Daniel's take on this. Some projects are not DIY. Restoring our relationship to God is one of those. We can't do it by good living. We can't do it with lots of Bible knowledge. We can't do it with correct doctrine. We can't do it by attending church lots. We can't do it by pursuing justice more passionately than anybody else. And we can't do it with any combination of those things. To restore our relationship with God, God had to come down here and do it himself in the person of Jesus on a cross. That was the only way to unbreak what was broken. You are not going to get to heaven, we sang about this earlier, dressed in glory that you manufacture yourself. The only way you and I get to have a relationship with God is when we are dressed in the glory, not our own. And so when we talk about putting your faith and hope and confidence in Jesus, that's what we're talking about. What we're saying is, I can't fix this, God. You have to fix that. And in Scripture, when people got to a point where they were ready to say, I'm tired of living in the brokenness. I'm not gonna, I don't want to live that way anymore. What they would do is they would acknowledge who Jesus was, the Son of God. And they would say, that's where I'm going to put my faith, my hope, my confidence. And then they were baptized. You know, the cool thing about baptism, the funny thing is, a lot of people think that's a work we do for God. You ever thought about how passive baptism is for you? I mean, you make the decision, I, I want to be baptized. And then somebody else lowers you into the water and pulls you back out. You don't do anything except yield. Baptism is not a work you do for God. It's a work God does in you. So if that's not a part of your story, can we talk? And if it is a part of your story, live like you are God's child, because you are. What's your broken window? Let's get to work on those and watch what happens. It'll be awesome. Let's stand. Let's sing together. One day you'll make everything new. Jesus, one day you will bind every wound. The former things shall all pass away. No more tears. One day you'll make sense of it all. Jesus, one day every question resolved. Water.
some business I need to take care of. I'm going to keep talking while I rearrange. For the last four months, we have been searching for a new team to come and join us in our ministry here, especially in ministry to our teenagers. We searched all over the country, all over the world. We looked in the highways and byways, and we found them right here. Who knew? So this morning, it is my opportunity to introduce them, an honor to introduce them to you, Adam Weigel and Autumn Knox. Would you guys join me? Very exciting. Now, they are married, but not to each other. Does everybody understand this? Adam's wife is Sarah. Sarah, wave at us. Oh, that was not a big wave right there. And Autumn's husband is Billy. Where's, right there's Billy. So you guys have a seat. Make sure you hold those mics close to us so that we can hear you. Because we don't often get to do this. Um, a lot of times it's just, hey, here's our people. Okay, that's great. So for a second at this opening, I wanted to just let them talk a little bit about themselves and introduce themselves to you and do that by way of question, those questions coming from our youth group. So we'll also get to see what kind of depth we have with our teenagers. Actual questions from our youth group. But before I do that, Adam graduated from Auburn University, born and raised in, in Auburn. No, no, eight years. Eight years. And he just finished teaching school at Ardmore High School and also did three internships at Mayfair. Yeah, yeah it, was a, it was a problem with the interview team. On, I know. Autumn grew up in Huntsville. She went to Harding University and graduated from there and then got a master's degree from Alabama just recently, like... Finished a month ago. Yeah, it helps if you hold that up there. Sorry. Perfect. Is it on? I need more, too. All right, try that again. Hello? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah, finished a month ago. Perfect. So that's a little bit on their background. But these are the questions the kids wanted to know about. Are you ready? Are you sure? <laughs> what is your favorite local restaurant, Autumn? Okay, my favorite local restaurant is not um, very known, but it's the Cozy Cow. So the it, Cozy it, Cow. Yes, it's, Billy would describe it as a girly restaurant, but I think it's awesome. It's downtown. It's got lattes, <laughs> ice cream sandwiches. Who has ever heard of the Cozy Cow? <laughs> Apparently, I'm an idiot. That's all. <laughs> Everyone else has what I have not. 
Have you heard of it? I have. Okay. Well, what's your favorite local eatery? Um, I'd have to say wherever Sarah wants to go for dinner. Oh. Uh, <laughs> hey, babe, you want to go to Taco Bell? I love tacos. Um, no, I'd say Grill 29 in Providence. Grill 29. No Rosie's fans. What a drag. I knew I was supposed to say that. Ooh, you guys watch out for this one. <laughs> what is your favorite animal? A, a, a tiger? Just. <laughs> I was going to say a water bear, but apparently that's a nerdy thing, so I don't say that. Tiger, over here. What do you got? Um, my favorite animal is a bear. A bear? Yes. I have the great desire to see one in the wild. So. You want to see a bear in the wild? See, there's something you didn't know. Ooh, we're going out there again. What, Autumn, is your favorite Marvel superhero? <laughs> Probably Captain America. Captain America. What happened to Batman? Or Batman. <laughs> Batman's not, not Marvel. Marvel. <laughs> Adam, what's your favorite uh, Marvel superhero? I would also say Captain America. Uh, for Captain America. I don't know. I just he's cool. He's cool. I, I don't follow Marvel well enough to really have an answer. Okay. This is gets better. Good. What is your favorite thing to do on a rainy day? Oh, uh, sleep. Always. Uh, if not that, cup of coffee and a good book. All right. Nap um, and also go to the movies. I think that's fun. So I'll need to be watching your offices when it rains to make sure you're not sleeping, I guess. <laughs> All right, last one. Why did you want to become a youth minister? Uh, I'll go. Um, well, when I think back on my teenage years, which was only like five years ago, um, one of the things that I think about the most people who played the biggest impact in my life was my youth ministers, and still to this day, they're some of my best friends and mentors, and so I am just thankful for the opportunity to get to give that back and walk along some people in their good and hard times and lead them to Christ. So. Excellent. Uh, my youth group was my family. Um, in high school. It was also one of the more formative years of my life. Um, and so I'm just happy and excited to be able to uh, give back and, and to be a good influence to um, other teenagers. And Adam grew up with 11 brothers and sisters, so he kind of grew up in a youth ministry by himself. His family was... <laughs> Two baseball teams, you know. <laughs> hey, guys, team. we're really excited. We're really, really blessed to have you, and we appreciate that you cared enough to want to do this. And so I want you to know that we want to do everything that we can to help you. And if we're not doing it, you need to let us know. All right? But I want to pray for you guys right now. Let's pray. God, we've been on a journey, and we're glad that that journey is uh, coming to an end. And so we look forward to all that is in store for our teens and for this church with the addition of these two wonderful, godly people that you have led to us. And so we ask your blessings on them. Um, that they would know and be able to discern the things to do to help us be what we need to be, and that we also would in turn um, be able to help and support them through all the things uh, that they'll be doing in the coming years. So just bless us as we work together. Thank you for Jesus who makes all of this have any meaning whatsoever. We know that one day you will make everything new, but until then, we want to continue to try to mend the broken. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say, amen. Welcome them. Now, one more thing. There has been one of our own who has helped us greatly over the last four months. Um, she has been caring and working hard and standing in the gap for our teens. Sonny Holman came on and joined us on an interim basis three months ago. Sonny, would you come up here and do you have Laura Grace with you? She's not going to go. Oh, Laura Grace, I have something for you. Oh, yeah, I'll go. Okay. <laughs> she changed her mind. Sonny has been working with and teaching and traveling with and events and everything, and she's done a great job caring for our kids and being here for them and for us. And Laura Grace has been our office mascot <laughs> because she's been around so much, and so this is for you, Sonny. And Laura Grace, you want to see it now? 
you're going to love it. It's just your style. Look at that pink, glittery. Look, it even... You take it. So, Sonny, thank you. Laura Grace, thank you. Jason, you weren't here much, but thank you. <laughs> hey, let's pray again. God, thanks for um, all the ways in which you bless us, and we especially want to just be thankful for Sonny, um, for all the work that she's done, for the time that she spent, and uh, just for her servant heart and her willingness to just be here for us in this interim. And so we give our thanks and our gratitude for the way that you've blessed her and helping her bless other people. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. So if you want to stand up, and we will close. Dinner to Devo tickets on sale or call the office. We've got hamburgers and hot dogs this Wednesday. Camp to Know Him is coming up. Get your forms in. Um, Hacienda of Hope Mission Trip t-shirts are available downstairs. Help us support that mission team going by purchasing one of those t-shirts. Uh, you can get those today even, $20 each. And teens, don't forget, we're going to throw water balloons and eat pizza tonight. So I'll see you at 530. Be ready. Hey, have a great day. Thanks for being here. We'll close in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we know that uh, we're broken. We thank you for sending Jesus, your son, to um, just to heal our brokenness, uh, to, make us, to make us whole. We thank you, God. We thank you so much for uh, all the blessings that we have in this world. I pray that we will enjoy them, uh, but also that we'll notice uh, all the brokenness and the struggle around us, that we'll be your hands and feet. Uh, and... Um, uh, just be sensitive and, and be your hands and feet and uh, do the good works that you've designed us to do, God, showing your love to others. I thank you for the new staff, that you'll bless their work. Thank you for Sunny and the things that she's done over the past four months. I pray for all the children downstairs. I pray that we'll be good examples of them, that we'll help them to grow strong in Christ. Thank you so much for, for him, for what he did for us. In, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.